Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are all having a nice day. So, in my Mega Man is inaccessible video, I spoke about a few games that could be really good for new players to get into the series. And today we are going to the polar opposite of that. Yeah, there is one specific game of the classic Mega Man series that is usually referred to as the hardest and sometimes worst game of the entire lineup. And you might ask, which game is that? Well, you've read the title and it's probably why you're watching this now. So yeah, it's Mega Man and Base. Hilariously enough, I really enjoy this game. I did back then when I played it as a kid, and I still find it fun to play through. So I thought of making this video to find out what made me grow attached to it, and maybe bring up some positives about this one contentious game. Okay, so get comfy, and let's get going, shall we? But before explaining why I'm fond of this specific game, I think it would be better if I give you some context about its development, release and reception. Mega Man & Base, known as Rockman & Forte in Japan, was first shown in December 1997, to those who attended the official Rockman 10th anniversary event. The man with the microphone is, of course, Keiji Inafune, who was the series director at the time. During this presentation, he expressed to the fans how this new game was going to be released for the Super Nintendo, a console that was facing its last years of activity after the launch of the Nintendo 64 a year prior to this event. Even if it sounds like a horrendous idea, Inafune had an explanation for this move. Even after the next generation came to be, many players still had a Super Famicom around at their homes, since there was never a shortage of games until 1997 came around. And so, Mega Man and Base will be specifically made for those fans who missed on Mega Man 8 because they didn't have the chance to upgrade their hardware. And yeah, it makes sense, especially if you take into account that the idea of buying a new console because the one you have is outdated was not perceived the same way back in the 90s as it is today. This game would include a new set of robot masters, designed by a team of three very talented artists. Koji Izuki took care of Pirate Man and Cold Man, Yoshihiro Iwamoto did the same for Ground Man and Magic Man, and finally Hitoshi Ariga, who had already worked on the Mega Man Megamix manga, made his gaming debut here as character designer for Burner Man and Dynamo Man, as well as some promotional art for the game. As for the other two robot masters, Tengu Man and Astro Man, they come straight from Mega Man 8, just like most of the sprites used across the game. And let me get this out of the way. Mega Man and Base looks impressive. Those complex animations showcased on its 32-bit equivalent haven't lost that much quality when implemented into the SNES. And so, the animation quality here is a massive step up compared to previous entries. If you check out the reveal video, you can clearly see that fans were hyped for this game. Not only did it look incredible, but it also will be the first time players will have the chance to play as Baze, who had the role of Mega Man's new rival in the last two entries of the classic series. And then, just four months after the 10th anniversary event, Rockman and Forte was placed onto store shelves. Even if it sold almost 100,000 copies, the reception from critics was somewhat lukewarm, with Famitsu giving the game a 24 out of 40. And so, the original Super Famicom cartridge never made it to any other region, until a port to Nintendo's Game Boy Advance was released in 2002. So now, what's up with the game, you might ask? If you try to look up a summary of the Mega Man base experience, you'll surely find most people mentioning how it's a really hard game. 
and not in the best of ways. In fact, it's usually referred to as the low point of the series, along with games like Mega Man X6 or X7. On the contrary, critics really praised the GBA version back in 02. So yeah, quite a polarizing game, isn't it? And well, as you might have noticed already by the title, I kinda like this game, so let's get on with why. First off, let me cover the basics, okay? Mega Man and Base act as some sort of alternate sequel to Mega Man 7. The plot follows the Blue Bomber and his rival, who now need to join forces against the Rise of King, a mysterious robot who kicked Dr. Wily out of his fortress and is now on his way to assault the Robot Museum in order to gather data to construct his new army. Once inside, the heroes find Proto Man, trying to put a stop to the villain's plans. Unfortunately, he is defeated in battle and King is allowed to make his escape, unleashing the Green Devil upon the duo of super fighting robots. And so, it's up to Mega Man and Base to defeat the stolen robot masters and stop King before it's too late. With this plot setup, you think that the game will play out as it usually does. You know, you fight the 8 robot masters and then after conquering the stage, you get their weapons and then use them on whoever is weak to it, and then the castle and the credits roll. But hear me out, because here's where things become pretty interesting. After exiting the robot museum, the game opens up in a radically different way. Here's Mega Man and Vase stage select screen. As you can clearly see, only three stages are available from the beginning, with the other five unlocking as the player defeats specific robot masters. This new take on the structure for a classic Mega Man game is… a double-edged sword. On one hand, you lose part of the freedom of tackling each stage in any order, since you'll only start at any of those three points. However, on the other hand, this opens up the door for more complex designs that take into account the fact that the player possesses specific weapons beforehand. A quick example is how Cold Man's weapon, the Ice Wall, can be used on both Burner Man and Pirate Man stages for very different purposes. Like, you know, defeating enemies on difficult spots, acting as a platform to reach safe terrain, or as an elevator of sorts. And so, weapons get a new use outside of boss weaknesses, and you know, just destroying enemies. Wave Burner can push obstacles when used underwater, Tango Blade gives you an invincible dash if you input a slide, and Magic Card can grab items dropped by enemies. If I'm being honest, this game might have one of the better sets of special weapons in the entire classic series, since none of them are clearly useless and they can aid the player in vastly different situations. Although the main talking point that surrounds Mega Man and Base is not the quality of its weapons, it's instead mostly about those pesky robot masters that carry them. So, just like I said a few moments ago, Mega Man and Base is well known for being a notoriously difficult game, and one of the main reasons that push people into thinking that comes in the form of its bosses. The eight main opponents are no joke. They all have unique and complex attack patterns that require different things from the player in order to win the fight. Interestingly, this is an intentional design choice. Aside from making the game for those players who didn't experience Mega Man 8, Keiji Inafune mentioned how the main target for Rockman and Forte would be the hardcore side of the fanbase. And so, they designed the game with those veteran players in mind, increasing the difficulty to a whole new level. However, hard does not mean impossible, and I can't help but enjoy these fights, despite most of them being some of the most hated bosses in the franchise. Let's take Denimo Man as an example. He's often mentioned as one of the toughest bosses in the game, thanks to his ability to recover HP mid-battle. However, he has a few core weaknesses. Despite being able to heal himself, he's hoping for attacks during most of the fight, and the recovery process can be interrupted by attacking the generators on both sides of him. And if you're having trouble with him by just bastarding him down, his weakness can be guessed pretty easily if you look carefully at a few of his attacks. 
Since most of them are homing shots that target either Mega Man or Base in some way, one can notice how the copy vision might be the perfect choice to fight him. This weapon not only stops two of his main attacks on their tracks, but also helps the player when dodging his third one. And this design philosophy is showcased across all eight main bosses. So yeah, they have more complicated attack patterns and some unique traits, but every attack has a solution and a way to avoid it. They are just harder to get used to, as you would expect from a game targeted for a veteran audience. The exception to this rule is Burning Man, and it's really sad because for the most part he's an awesome boss. In theory, he's an aggressive enemy, always on the move with a wide variety of attacks that have different tails so players can respond properly to each one of them. His weakness is also utilized in a very creative way, since when he comes to a stop you can use the ice wall to push him into the spikes, dealing massive damage. This weapon is also useful for stopping his wave burner attack and then counter it. However, in practice, he is not that good. <laughs> the main issue is how his arena is designed. Because it's so wide, he'll often go off screen, which not only makes it impossible for you to see his next move coming, but also unloads his hitbox, so you need to keep him on screen for the spikes to actually damage him. And also, even if you can escape from being cornered by using Ice Wall, the hitbox of his flamethrower can still reach you sometimes. It's pretty wonky. <laughs> so yeah, instead of a more complex boss that elevates the difficulty by just being a smart, fast opponent, he comes off as an RNG nightmare <laughs> that can hit you from outside of your TP's boundaries and then corner you in an instant. However, even if Burner Man is a poorly thought boss among a cast of pretty cool enemies, I can't say the same thing about most stages. I would be lying if I didn't say that some rooms in Mega Man and Base are absolutely BS, like Joku blocks over spikes type of BS. Although, I would also be lying if I didn't mention how each stage has a unique gimmick attached to it, and unlike Mega Man 8, without feeling too far from the core formula of the classic Mega Man games. And this brings many interesting ways to challenge the player, like the conveyors or darkened halls of Dynamo Man stage, the freezing blocks in Cold Man stage, or the totem puzzles of Ground Man. These set pieces are honestly pretty awesome, especially considering how you can find different solutions to get around them sometimes even leading to alternate paths, giving you an extra ounce of exploration at which Mega Man and Base kinda shines at. But despite these moments of brilliance, I can't ignore the fact that level design is probably the weakest aspect of this game, critically speaking. And this creates a bizarre feeling when playing the game, because on one hand you have very imaginative levels with memorable set pieces, but on the other hand, there are some bits of each stage that really suck. You might be platforming by using sliding ice blocks, having fun, and then 5 minutes later you can find yourself playing Simon Says or dying over and over to a very unforgiving auto-scroller. And nothing showcases this hit or miss type of level design than King's Tower. So, once players complete all 8 Robot Master stages, the seals that protect the entrance to King's Tower can be finally destroyed, marking the beginning of the endgame. The final stretch in Mega Man and Base is infamous for being a gauntlet of grueling trials, one after the other. The first floor of the tower is a very tough stage not only combining previous challenges in new ways, but also showcasing some really complex enemy placements that force players into using all of their tools properly. The first level ends with a very interesting spin on a tatemino. In Mega Man 8, this boss was more like a puzzle that requires some skill with the Mega Ball in order to defeat him. Here it's a really cool idea that sadly wasn't implemented too well. To damage him, 
players would need to stand on the lever to pull him up and reveal his face, which is also his weak spot, being careful not to drop too low while dodging his multiple attacks. Copy vision being his weakness makes a lot of sense, since not only makes it easier to land shots on him, but also the monkey's attacks will go after the clone instead of Mega Man. The problems come in two different ways. One, he can spawn mini tataminos from the lava pool, and trying to see them coming is almost impossible, since their animation gets obscured by the platform you are standing on. Its other problem is how after defeating him, the lever breaks and players can accidentally die by falling into the lava pool. So yeah, he's a perfect representation of Mega Man and Base's biggest flaw, its lack of quality across the board. Because yes, there are great ideas, but some of them are not implemented properly, which can lead to a bad experience when playing. But then, King's Tower's second floor comes into play. This is the most infamous stage in the entire game. The concept is simple, the level is divided into three different sections. Each of them offer a specific challenge, though they are mostly based around facing different enemies in various situations, like ladders or tricky platforming. What makes this stage stand out though are the bosses. At the end of the first two sections, players will need to face a mid-boss, this being King Tank and King Plane. I will not lie to you, these two chunks of metal are really tough opponents, demanding pattern recognition and some expertise when using the main character's arsenal. Even though King Tank is somewhat simple, though it's a pretty long fight, King Plane is a different story. This is one of the two fights that change depending on who you are playing as, with Base getting less platforms to stand on to compensate for his dash and double jump. King Plane's only weak spot is its control module, located on the top. As for his offensive capabilities, he can do many things, like trying to blind your sight, shooting you with a massive laser attack, or even breaking your platforms. If you manage to survive all of that, then you get to play the last stretch of the level, and finally face King. Thanks to the combined efforts of Mega Man, Base, and Proto Man, he is finally defeated, but then Dr. Wily is revealed to be the one behind all of this, and reprograms King to fight you once more, now on board his massive robot. And after all of that, you can finally leave King Tower's second stage and move on to the third and final one. This stage is insane, and even more considering how losing all your lives will send you back to the very first screen. And the game doesn't let up either, with the final stage combining some really hard platforming challenges with the usual boss rush, and then the final confrontation with Dr. Wily. All of this is tough by itself, but it gets elevated to another level thanks to the lack of E-Tanks or most other healing options present in past games. Because yes, Mega Man gets Eddie, but the power-ups he gives you are random, so the only way to recover energy for both characters is to buy an upgrade from Auto's shop that heals HP when standing still. Yeah, not the most exciting way to fill up a health bar. So now, after discussing the pros and cons about the game, you might wonder, how can you find so much enjoyment out of this? And well, let me explain myself. So, I am aware of the game's biggest flaws, and I know that they are there and will always be there no matter what. But aside from some poor design choices, I seriously never thought of this game as one of the worst entries in the classic Mega Man series. And it's just because, even if the game is brutally hard, it's just how it was meant to be, and it shows when you finally get the hang of some of its quirk. Every challenge has a solution, mostly intended and sometimes not, but either way, nothing is impossible to beat. 
Also, the shop in Mega Man on base might be one of the best in the entire series, with very useful upgrades and equipable items that offer perks like reduced knockback, less ammo consumption, and so on. And even without this, the game is perfectly beatable, as both Mega Man and Base. And so, here's where I want to tackle something that has been said about this game for many years. And it's how Rockman and Forte has gained a reputation of being more of a base game rather than a Mega Man game, regarding the Blue Bomber as the hard mode, because he can get around platforming challenges with the same finesse as his rival. Our usual protagonist plays like he used to in past games. Slide, charge shot, you know the drill. However, Base gets a rapid fire buster that can be aimed in multiple directions a dash and a double jump. And on the surface, he might seem like the best character, no questions asked. The thing is, both characters have strengths and weaknesses. Even if Base gets the upper hand while navigating each stage, his buster struggles against boss fights, and he also finds himself fighting against a few bosses quite differently. Thus, I feel like both characters balance themselves really well. And despite the problems showcased by the overall level design, it's great to see how the developers created every single environment with both characters in mind, especially considering the vastly different playstyles that the two heroes are based around. With that in mind, I can confidently say that despite those BS moments, the game remains fair to the player, and with some back and forth, most veteran players should be able to clear the game. And yes, dying at the end of King Tower or the Wily stage is not great, it's a terrible feeling, but with every fight, every challenge being mostly fair towards the player, once you finally pull through and reach the credits, that feeling of satisfaction is incredible. And this is why I really enjoy hard games. The rush of conquering a challenge seemingly impossible by your own merits makes you feel quite badass, and Mega Man and Base truly seems unbeatable at the first glance, but with patience and learning, you'll run through with no problems. It also helps how the controls are really polished. Both characters respond smoothly to the player's inputs. Mega Man's charge shot feels as great as always, and it also got back some of the damage it lost in Mega Man 7. And in Base's case, his Rapid Fire Buster is very simple to understand and easy to get used to. Also, if you've played Mega Man X, you'll quickly notice how Base's dash sorta works like Mega Man X's. So yeah, you shouldn't have too many issues adapting to this game. And last but not least, if you have a keen eye for collectibles and secrets, Mega Man and Base hides 100 CDs across its levels. These are part of the Robot Museum's database, which means that they contain info about all the characters and Robot Masters featured in previous games. It's like a massive Wikipedia instead of a game. Although, to gather all of them, you'll need to complete the game as both characters, since almost half of them are exclusive to either Mega Man or Base. So, this concept really expands some of the exploration aspects that were featured in Mega Man 7 and Mega Man 8. With it being completely optional, players who just want to get to the end can just do that, while those who love checking out every nook and cranny have something to look forward to, and the reward, being small bits of trivia about the franchise's characters, is perfect to boost that curiosity. Even if finding some of these requires you to buy upgrades from the shop, since a few of those discs are buried under the ground, I never found it too intrusive if you're up for a quick compact disc hunt. And of course, before wrapping up this video, I have to mention the GBA port. The thing is, like I said, the original Super Famicom version was never released outside of Japan, not even to this day. And even if the game itself did cross the oceans, it only arrived as an adaptation to Nintendo's GBA in 2003. Of course, the limitations of the system forced developers to cut out some corners, and the result is something that was impressive for that time, 
but almost unplayable nowadays. I personally have no issues with the lower sound quality or the slightly bright color palette since those are inherent traits to most early GBA games, but the screen crunch is not ideal. And since Nintendo's portable console only had four buttons, base can only dash by double tapping the D-pad, and that feels so uncomfortable to me. Hilariously enough, this is the version of Mega Man and Base that got a re-release on the Virtual Console, and that leads me to think that the reputation this game has gained for itself is mostly related to the existence of this port, since, well, we had no choice back then. I too played this version first, and jumping from this to the SNES original felt like cranking up that FOB slider man, holy cow. So yeah, avoid this version, or at least keep in mind that you will be playing a compromise port, okay? Alright, I guess this is time to gather up my thoughts and finally shut up. Mega Man and Base nowadays feels like the lost chapter of the classic Mega Man series. Since the GBA version's release on the Wii U Virtual Console, the game has not appeared in any of the legacy collections. And even if it's not a perfect game, I think it deserves more attention. I am aware that most of you might not agree with my opinion on Rockman and Forte, since my tolerance for hardcore games is almost ridiculous. And in, in case you want to hop into one of the classic games, yeah, do not play this one as your entry point, please. <laughs> But for the veterans, I think it's a worthy contender for one of the most challenging games on the SNES, and also one of the best looking games on the system. It tried to experiment with some new design choices, but the heart and soul of a Mega Man game is right there and it shows. The weapon set is fantastic, most boss fights have intricately designed patterns, and that can lead to some insanely fun encounters once the player learns how to properly respond to each of the boss's antics. And even if the last stretch of the game ramps up the difficulty in a pretty insane manner, the feeling of accomplishment once you land that final shot on Dr. Wily is priceless, even after many playthroughs. Now, I think I have this one. This is it. This. Has to be it. Two more shots. Come on, come on. Oh, come here. There we go. Die! Yes! 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 Oh, finally! Eat that, you freaking petardo! Ah, got him. To conclude, I have to say that I admire the purpose behind the game's existence. Inafune's team put their hearts into the game, despite the risks of releasing a new entry during the dawn of a legendary console. And why? Just to give something new to those younger fans who didn't have the money to buy a new console. And despite this, the developers tried their best, with new mechanics, detail graphics, and an impressive soundtrack. As game designer Hideki Ishikawa wrote on the Mega Man Complete Work series of books, the team felt like a big party that tried their best to avoid falling into the same design concepts of previous entries. So do I enjoy Mega Man and Base? Absolutely, and I feel like it's one of those cases where it's not an underrated game, but it's definitely overhated, and if you haven't played the SNES version yet, give it a shot. Please do, because maybe you'll discover something new, just like I did. And even if you end up not enjoying the game, I'll be happy knowing that you got to know about it. And that's because despite causing disparity among fans, I think Mega Man and Base deserves to be remembered. This is Burncrow SP, and thank you for watching. Hey there, thanks for staying until the end. I am recording this without any script now, so... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for watching, 
make sure to, you know, drop the like and subscribe and the usual stuff that YouTubers say at the end of their videos. I just want you to, you know, let me know if you enjoyed this and maybe comment and let me know about what you think about Mega Man and Base. Just keep it polite, okay? <laughs> and yeah, you know, uh, I'll see you next time. Maybe you should check out that time where I played the game live to gather up the footage that you've seen for this video because maybe you'll get some fun out of it. And well, yeah, uh, stay tuned for new updates, take care, and I'll see you next time.